everyone. Um, welcome to uh, the Makers Demo Day for uh, February 2023. Um, my name is John. Uh, I'm one of the uh, software engineering coaches here at Makers. Um, and this evening, we're here to uh, showcase some of the fantastic final projects that um, February have, have produced. Uh, each project, each team will present what they've been working on uh, since Monday of last week. And uh, afterwards, we'll have a Q&A with me and uh, also Nikki, our uh, marketing and events coordinator. So if you're if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, to stick around for that. Um, as many of you will know, um, Makers is a 16 week coding bootcamp. Um, it's a, an intensive experience. And over the course of the time here, uh, developers go from knowing uh, some very minor coding basics to being able to build full stack applications from scratch. Um, just a few months, months ago, the developers that you're going to see tonight were um, taking part in their first week here, getting to grips with test driving, um, pair programming, and, uh, and using object-oriented programming. Um, and now, 16 weeks later, they've, they can build and deploy entire projects to create the products they themselves would like to use. Um, I've had a really lovely time working with, with February over the last couple of weeks. Um, and I've been consistently impressed by uh, their uh, resilience, how, how much effort they've put in, but specifically how well they support one another and um, the camaraderie that have been shown within the teams. Um, the whole cohort has made incredible progress over the last 16 weeks. Um, each week, they're faced with brand new topics, new challenges, and you have to build upon uh, what they've learned so far um, to get through step by step. And uh, they've definitely risen to that challenge together. Uh, you've set out to learn so many things over the last 10 days to produce these projects, and uh, you've done a really fantastic job. It's really great to see uh, what it is that you've, you've produced, and I hope that um, the people coming here to see it too will agree with me. They're, they're really fantastic projects. Um, I'm really happy for all of you, and I really hope you're proud of the achievements that you've made over the last few months, because it really is something to be proud of. Um, so without further delay, uh, I'd like to introduce our first uh, team for this evening, which is uh, Team Borrow My Garden. Hi, everyone. Um, the idea behind our project was primarily to address the lack of available allotment spaces within cities. Um, wait lists for allotment plots can often exceed 15 years, which is a ridiculous long time to wait. Our idea, Borrow My Garden, provides a platform for garden owners who don't use their garden to connect with those who don't have but would like to have a garden space on which to grow their own fruit and veg. Once signed up, a user can log in and list their garden, specifying features for the garden, whether they have um, a flower garden or a veg garden, its size and its location. As well as creating a platform for keen gardeners, our project is also designed to help build a sense of community um, and tackle in a small way the growing cost of living crisis by providing more spaces for people to grow their own fruit and veg. Our first port of call when starting the project was to draw on some thumbnails um, that we we drafted up. Um, we found it really helpful to follow these quite closely throughout the project. I'll hand over to Fiona now, who will take you through a demo. Cool. Thank you very much. Let me just share my screen. Here we go. Thank you, Leah. Here is our website and the sign up page. There we go, and we can set up our user, sign up, and here is the login page. And we can log in here, and then you see we've got a nice little nav bar at the top, and this is our landing page. So welcome to Borrow Your Garden, and let's list a garden here. And what 
we have here is we can put in the title of your garden, the description of your garden, this can be as long or as short as you like, size of the garden and the postcode and the garden type. And then we submit this and then we take them to the choose your garden page. So this is a list of all of our gardens here. And then if we scroll all the way down, we've got Poppy's garden. So lovely south facing garden in South London. And then here we can click on more details where it will then show you in addition, the garden size, garden postcode and the garden type. And this is the connect button where you would connect to other users. Uh, currently this functionality isn't quite ready yet. And then if we go back to browse gardens, this is what you would see if you click here on find a garden. There we go. I shall now hand over to James. Thanks Fiona. So I'm gonna spend uh, some time talking about the learning journey that we went on as a team and uh, some, in, some of the working principles that we followed. So we agreed from the outset that the focus of the project was to push ourselves technically and focus on the learning process rather than the end result. We stuck to agile methodologies throughout having two stand-ups and a retro per day. We started this pretty well, and we've all reflected on the benefits of having a retro and how that can be great for communication across the team. We use JIRA as our task management tool to divvy up the project tickets and use a variety of collaboration methods, working in mob for project setup, collaborating in pairs on styling and taking individual issues off to work solo. On reflection, a massive part of our time was spent troubleshooting some of the issues we came across. It, this was mainly because of the use of uh, new technologies or new to us, like MongoDB Atlas for cloud database infrastructure. And Sanjay is going to talk a little bit more about this now. Thank you. To expand on troubleshooting, one of the main issues we had was that because we were using MongoDB Atlas, it wasn't locally stored on our machine. And because of that, we had to connect to it. And that connection came with some issues. But looking at some of the ways we resolved the issues, one of the main ways we did so was through giving trust and flexibility to individuals to allow them to work on their own and figure out problems on their own. And this was immensely beneficial as it allowed them to solve problems in a creative way that couldn't be done if we were just breathing down their necks. The second thing that helped in troubleshooting was coming to the realization that chat GPT is not something to rely upon, but it's a search engine that can help you because if you do rely on it, you will get more issues than solutions. Now I'd say the final thing that we did was that we didn't hog tickets or we weren't adamantly stuck on a single ticket. If we didn't, um, if we got to a point in a ticket and didn't quite uh, finish it, we would allow someone else to go and finish it. And by doing that, we allowed new eyes to be put upon different tickets. And now I will move it on to Kira. Thank you, Sanjay. Um, I'll talk a little bit about our team dynamics. Our team had a balanced mix of personalities that worked well together. Although we were all software developers, we naturally took on different roles. Some team members were natural project leaders, some were facilitators, and some were out-of-the-box thinkers who helped us overcome challenges. As individuals, we kept the pressure and stress levels low. Our team dynamic was empathetic as we shared the workload and showed the understanding during sick days. We assigned tasks based on individuals' existing strengths or their desire to improve knowledge gaps. We took the time to set up our own project as a team, which meant that we were all experienced in the learning process together. Our brainstorming was effective and no one was left behind at the start of the project. This hampered us on team resources, but it built the confidence of all team members. As mentioned before, in the beginning of the project, we all wanted to learn something new and push ourselves. We all agree that we achieved this goal. The whole team has now a better understanding of the MERN stack, which is a common set of technologies and its real world possibilities. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Um, is that's that's the last member of your team to speak. Yeah. Cool. No worries. Uh, thank you, team. Um, borrow my garden. Uh, the next group that we have for you today are here to teach you Python and have come up with a a fun way to do it. So uh, please welcome team Hacker Room.
Thanks, John. Uh, afternoon, everyone. I am the designated screen sharer, so I'll just share my screen and I'll pass you over to Monica to kick you off. Right. Monica, whenever you're ready, count me in. Yep. Uh, three, two, one. Hi, everyone. And welcome to our final project presentation, which is a learning tool called Hacker Room. The premise of the game is about a character who we've classified as the hero being in a cyber futuristic hacker room where he has to interact with items in order to complete the game. However, the catch is while interacting with each item, he must answer a range of knowledge based Python questions in order to move on to the next item of the, of the room. As you can see on the screen, we've created mock ups which were to help with the ideation process and create a clear vision of what we want to do. We also use a task management tool called Jira in order to organize and prioritize different tasks. Now Samuel will take us through the next part. Thank you, Monica. So um, to start with, we are on the sign up page where we take three pieces of information from the user, the username, the email address, and the password. And this is all stored in a database called MongoDB and the password is encrypted for extra security. Um, in this case, we've already created a account. Um, so instead we're gonna click the login link um, to log in. Um, here we can sign in with our email address and password. A wrong email address will prompt the user of that. And similarly, a wrong password will be prompted to the user as well. Um, Upon putting in the correct credentials, you are greeted with a welcome message uh, with your username and the controls needed to interact with the game. So from here, we can start the game and I'll pass this over to Destin to talk about animation. Um, yeah, guys, here you see our game in all its glory. Um, this is our, our character, our hero, Morgan. Uh, Morgan has the functionality to move around left, right, up, down. We do this by essentially our code wait and listens for the last key that the user entered. Uh, if they enter the left key, then we correspond that with our sprite sheet. So essentially um, the, the character looks to the left and that's done on the fly. Uh, we also have collision logic implemented. As you can see, uh, the hero cannot go through objects placed down on the Apologies for the background noise. Place down on the map. Uh, and we use this collision logic as well uh, for interactability. So interactable objects, the user can press space to unlock the submenu for each object. Uh, and this is only conditional though. So um, they have to fulfill the criteria of being in reachable distance to the object. So if you press space in the middle of the screen, nothing will happen. Uh, I'll pass on to Ayub now to discuss a bit further about our objects in the game. Thanks, Destin. So I'll be taking you through the two objects on the right. Um, so the bookshelf is where the user can go to learn about Python. There will be various different topics and each topic will have a quiz afterwards. Um, once the user is done learning, they can click the escape key to leave the bookshelf. And if at any time they want to come back and revise what they learned so far, they can go back to the bookshelf and do so and learn about all the different topics that we have. Um, Next, after they're done revising, they can go to the server, and this is where they practice what they've learned. So on the left, we have a code editor for Python 3, and on the right, we have the output. Um, if the user inputs some Python code, so for this demo, it will be print hello, and they click the run button, the output will show on the right, as you can see. Um, and if they make a mistake or there's an error, the output shows the error, the line number, and what to do to fix it. Um, now I'll pass you over to Lisa so that she can explain one of the quizzes. Okay, so if we walk over to the wall computer, interact with it, it presents us with the first topic, hello world. If we hit spacebar to continue, we, um, as you can see, we've implemented a multiple choice star quiz. Um, if we select an answer and get it wrong, it tells us to try again. If we select the correct answer, there we go. It tells us we got it correct and moves us on to the next question. There'll be a few questions. So each object will have a set of questions which you work your way through them. 
And once we get to um, the last question, if we get it right, it presents us with a congratulations page. And it essentially tells us where to go, um, what object to go to next to explore the next topic. And I'll pass you over to Samuel now. Thank you, Lisa. So yeah, after that, um, you can press the escape key to access um, the menu in which you can either log out or go to the settings. Um, in this demo, we're gonna go to the settings in which you're greeted with the user information you inputted on the sign up page, i.e. the email address, username and password. And you can change all of these details. So again, in this demo, we're gonna change the email address um, and this is updated in the database on the back end and refreshed on the front end upon saving. And as I mentioned before, you can do this um, with the username, you can change the username and you can change the password. And if for whatever reason you wanna delete your account, you can also do that too. Um, where your user information will be deleted in the back end and you'll be sent to the login page. And there we are. That is Hacker Room. That's our presentation. Thank you for listening. And yeah, it's been a pleasure working with my team. Thank you, Team Hacker Room. Um, our third team this evening have uh, reimagined a classic game uh, in a cyberpunk future. Uh, over to you, uh, Team Mini Retro. Hi everyone, our team is called Mini Retro and our project was to recreate the popular dice game Yahtzee. We could often be seen in the optional evening Mini Retros that took place just for our cohort at the end of the day throughout the course. The sense of community this created is just what we wanted to bring into our final project. Our team did a great job of staying fun even where the pressure was on. We stayed together as a unit and we were able to to easily challenge each other's ideas and give feedback in a natural way. This kept us motivated and focused and allowed us to get a product we are truly proud of. I will pass it on to Callum to talk about the project overview. Thank you, Valeria. For those who are unfamiliar, Yahtzee is a board game in which players roll five dice with the aim to score as many points as possible by completing various combinations within three rolls, such as three of a kind, and a straight. To increase their chance of hitting the desired combination, players can choose to hold any of the dice after each roll. We have a quick video to give you a short run through of the game mechanics before talking about the tech stack and logic behind the scoring. Welcome to a quick tour of Mini Retro's Yahtzee. Right now we can see the landing page, which has a cyberpunk retro arcade style animated background. The neon sign title seems to have fallen into disrepair slightly. We've got a nav bar at the top, and we've got this play button. Welcome to arcade mode. We've got everything we need here to play an awesome game of Yahtzee. We've got the dice, we've got the scoreboard. We're going to toggle the music off right now, because then we're going to hit this pink roll button. OK, we've got our first result. Um, we've got a couple of threes here. Let's keep hold of that, and let's roll again. And I think we can do a little bit better. Let's go for a full house. We got it. The scoreboard is kind enough to show us where the best place to put our dice is, uh, at our score is at any given time. I'll put that in the full house and on to the next round. And that's the flow of the game. We've got a little feature here to tip the odds slightly in our favor. It's called the only Yahtzee button. Yahtzee is the name of the, the, name of the game. So let's see what it does. Yahtzee. Nice. Let's go again. Oh, yeah. I've got a game here as well that I made earlier um, to show you the last roll of the game. That's weird. I've got a Yahtzee again. Here's our score. Um, we've got the option to save this now. Um, you can add your username. My name is Josh. And I'm going to be this blue character here. There we go, my score has gone to the top, funnily enough. Um, we've also got a multiplayer feature, which is really cool. So you can play a local multiplayer with some friends. So you can do your role right there. They can do their role. Or if uh, you don't have any in one round or you don't like playing Yahtzee with them when they're round, we've got add a bot feature as well. So you can play against our AI player.
Great. Um, and that is the end of this demo. Thanks so much. Thank you, Josh. We built the game using the MERN stack, an acronym for Mongo, Express, React, and Node, a group of commonly combined programming languages to create interactive websites like ours. To reduce the number of bugs, we also use testing software known as Cypress and Jest throughout development. Onto the game logic. An important part of the game is obviously scoring. We needed to code the website to be able to read the numbers on the rolled dice and check if they matched a scoring combination. We achieved, achieved this by using JavaScript's conditional statements, which is essentially, if this, then do this, otherwise do that. To elaborate further, let's take a look at the three of a kind combination. The code examines each number on the dice and records the frequency of each value. If there are three or more occurrences of the single value, the code awards the sum of all dice as points. If not, it awards zero points. Chang's now going to talk us through the game design. Uh, thank you, Kalum. Um, yes, so another important aspect of the game is uh, his design, because the way a game looks and feels plays a crucial role in engaging players and making them uh, making the experience memorable. And I believe uh, we were really effective in creating one of those unique experiences, as you've seen, bringing features to life with animations, light effects, music, and sound. Um, our idea was to transport the player to a cyberpunk universe, which is known to be a counterculture depicting worlds where those who take chances thrive, and that's what ERC is all about. And this is an aspect that we've translated in our game via the multiplayer mode that allows players to compete against each other. And further into the game development, we also implemented an AI player that Josh is going to talk you through more in details. Um. Thank you very much. So um, the uh, Yahtzee bot, uh, the goal of this was to demystify uh, AI by building uh, our own bot player from scratch. Throughout the Maker's course, we learn about technologies, learn how they work, and learn how to use them to sort of express, express our ideas or meet goals. And that, that was ours. Um, this one was inspired by uh, Total War strategy games. So Total War with, um, if you're familiar, um, the opponent uh, AI players, they are given a series of um, options and depending on the state of the game, those options are given different weight. So we've implemented this by um, assigning dice values weights. And then these weights are adjusted given uh, the state of the game or the dice result. That generates a threshold. And then the AI opponent is able to select dice to hold and carry through to the next round um, uh, what what they need to to get the best score. Um, we're really pleased with it, we're really proud. Um, the average score for a beginner player in Yahtzee tends to be between 150 and 200 points. And uh, our Yahtzee bot in the first version um, was a score of 180 um, uh, as an average. And the version two, which is currently uh, here, is uh, average score of 193. So we're, we're we're very proud of it. The next version is gonna um, just clip 200, I think, but um, I'm still working on that and um, I, I can't beat it. So that's good enough, right? <laughs> um, now over to Paul. Thank you, Josh. <clears throat> Our project only requires a light backend and uh, focuses primarily on the front end and uh, visuals. The backend keeps track of all player scores and uh, we store everything on the server so the leaderboard can be displayed on the screen with the first 10 highest scores displayed at the top. Uh, moving on to testing, we've, had a, uh, we've used a um, specialized software to test the backend, uh, reaching 100% uh, coverage, and another software to test the front end um, of our application. Uh, by testing, we ensure that our program works as intended, and it simulates a real user's uh, interaction with the app, including the ability to roll dice, select score options, and finish the game. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Team Mini Retro. Um, sorry, Team. Uh, yeah, Team Mini Retro. Um, we have one team left uh, to uh, present this evening. And that is a uh, team career companion who have uh, come up with a, a platform for job hunters. Please take it away. Thank you. I'm just going to share my screen and hand over to Comrade. Hello. 
So we are Team Career Companion, also known as the Career Companion. Career Companion is your ultimate job search assistant. It will help you track your job applications, manage upcoming interviews, and even allow you to train for them with ChatGPT acting as your interviewer and giving you helpful feedback in the process. But before we dive into those and other features that we've built, let me tell you about our motivations first. We wanted to build an app that we would want to use ourselves after the Makers course. We wanted to build something that we would love to keep building on after the Makers course finishes. We wanted to build something that's a real company, that has a real life use case. And most importantly, we wanted to simply learn and enjoy the process. So now let me pass the mic to Adnan, who will tell you about the absolute abundance of fun that we had over the last two weeks. Thank you, Conrad. So this is our team, the four compadres. Speaking of fun and team building, one of the most important aspects of building a project is team chemistry. Just learning from past projects and life experiences, if the team chemistry is excellent, the overall process will be smooth, enjoyable for all, and just looking at the presentation slides, the jokes and the laughter carried on until the very last day. At the start, I think we all just felt excited and motivated, which just led to a whole day dedicated to brainstorming ideas with must-haves and nice-to-haves all put on a planning board. And using the planning board, we created a wireframe with Figma. This led to an illustrated concept how we think the website should look. Now I will pass it on to Francesco and he will discuss the different technologies used within our projects. Thank you, Adnan. So for the creation of this app, we used entirely JavaScript, HTML, and CSS with some additional JavaScript features known as the man stack to make the user experience smoother. At the back end, represented by the lower part of the iceberg, we have a server that communicates with a database that will intercept and manage all the requests sent by the user interaction. The passwords are encrypted to uh, make sure the information uh, from the user are securely stored. And throughout these past two weeks, we ha I have to say we implemented a fairly solid amount of features. ChatGPT not only was a useful tool to get some ideas, but our original plan was to make a part of our application itself by introducing AI-generated cover letters, interview questions, and feedback to those questions to help the user speed up their job hunting process. Above the iceberg, on the user side of things, we used technologies such as React, Tailwind CSS, wireframes, and other features to get the styling we wanted and to make the app mobile responsive. And now, <laughs> before enjoying the weekend, Fairly, to be honest, at this stage, Sarah is going to give you a demonstration of our AI-powered career companion. Enjoy. Okay, bear with me two seconds. Okay, so this is the landing page for our website, which just gives you a bit more information and about the features of our project. Um, we've also got dark mode incorporated on our website um, you can sign up here we've got all the validation for the email and the password I'm just going to sign in with an account that I created earlier here um, once you sign in this takes you to the dashboard you can see your stats at the top for your current job applications um, and links to the different web parts of the website um, then we have the applications that are either completed or incomplete. You can manually add an app application for a job that you might have seen or are applying for, putting in the key details such as the company, the job title, um, the location, a link to the original job posting, and any key details that you want to save on there as well. You can select the current status for your application, um, and once you've done that, it will show on the screen and you can see the key details. You can also update the application status. So if you've been offered an interview, you can put in the interview date on there as well. Um, and you're also able to delete any applications you no longer want on there. 
We next have the interview training. So we used open AI here to generate questions for the most popular job roles in tech at the moment. Um, these are just some that I filled in previously. So I've put in the answers for those questions. And upon submitting it, OpenAI will generate the feedback. So it will let you know what was good about your answers um, or what could be improved with them as well. Um, then we have our resume builder. So this allows you to put in all of your personal details, your education, your experience, your skills, and that will all formulate a CV for you, which you're then able to save as a PDF um, or print out as well. Um, next, we have our cover letter generator. So the cover letter generator also uses open AI. Um, you can put in the details for the job that you want to apply for and add your CV just to make it more personal. And then upon generating that, it will create your personalized cover letter for you. And you can save this or copy it into whatever file you need or email. Um, and then we have our research companies. So here you can leave a review for any company that you may have had an interview with or an experience. You can choose a rating for that, um, leave feedback. Maybe if you've had an interview, you can leave the questions that were asked there. And then you're able to search for that for any companies as well. So if you're looking for a specific company, you can type that in and see what other users have left as a review. Um, and you can also delete if you if you wish to as well. Um, and then we have an account. So you can update your personal account details on here. Um, and the website is also fully mobile responsive. So it will work on any device um, and still look good. Um, yeah, that's pretty much our website. So I'll hand back over to Comrade. Yeah, just a few last words. Um, this was Career Companion. Career Companion is currently in beta, but will be available to the public uh, probably by the end of next week. So for any job seekers out there, please do reach out. We'll send you over the link. We'll help you out. And thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much, team Career Companion. Um, and thank you so much to all of our project teams uh, today. Um, I've said it before, but I'm I'm so happy for you and for everything that you've achieved over the last uh, few months. You, I really hope you're proud of yourselves because you you definitely should be. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to meet and work with you over the um, over your time so far with Makers, and I'm really excited to see where you go next. Um, take it easy this weekend. I love that front end, back end, weekend post. That was excellent. Um, you really need to take it easy this weekend. You've, you've definitely earned a rest. Um, and yeah, celebrate however you can. Um, I'm going to hand over to Nikki now um, for our Q&A. Um, so please do stick around if you have questions for us about the Makers course, uh, the kind of things we coach here, our curriculum, how to apply, whatever it is that you might be wondering around, about. Um, uh, once more, thank you again to all of our teams, and uh, I hope you all have a lovely weekend. Thank you, John. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Nikki from the marketing and events team and makers. Um, first of all, before everyone goes, congratulations. Your projects were amazing. Um, love Demo Day. You always get to see the coolest, most innovative things. And yeah, I'm really pleased for you all. And yeah, you guys can all just chill out now, relax. You deserved it. Um, so yeah, for the um, as John said, for the next 30 minutes, we're going to be doing a QA. Um, basically, uh, if you will answer any questions about the application process, life at makers, um, John will be on more of the technical side, um, the nitty-gritty parts of the curriculum. Um, and yeah, just anything really, anything you're curious about, ask us, just pop it in the chat in the QA box, um, and we will get that answered for you best as best we can. I'll just see if we've got any at the moment. Oh, we've got a couple of nice comments to the team. People said, Re really like your website, great project, congratulations, great projects. Um, yeah, so very good feedback for from, from people watching. Um, okay, so before, if, if there's no other questions for me and John at the moment, I'm just gonna kind of pop through, talk a little bit about the next um, course start date and then um, a few resources that we have available. 
for anyone looking to to learn so the next course start date is on the 10th of july um and that is a little bit usually we do um one cohort a month but it's because we've got a we're restructuring the curriculum so um that's the reason that there's not another one until then um and that one will finish on the 27th of october um and you can apply for that just now on our website um if you are thinking about um if you're wanting to get to know a little bit more about the curriculum before you apply we do have workshop free workshops available um, so anyone can attend. You don't have to have any coding experience at all. Our next one is actually on Python, and that's on the 9th of May. Um, it's called Taster Tuesdays, which I'll send a link to in the follow-up email after this. Um, but basically, um, our coaches just go through the um, Python fundamentals, and they'll do it once a week, every Tuesday for the next four weeks, um, just to give you a little taster of our new curriculum, essentially. Um, so it's, I, I highly recommend if it's something if you're if you're a little bit nervous about applying, uh, it's really helpful. Just see if we've got any questions at all. No, no questions yet. No questions, silly. By the way, ask anything. Okay, so we've got first one. Um, will any of the future cohorts be fully remote as before, or are you planning to completely move to hybrid mode? Um, we are what we want to keep it hybrid at the moment um we don't as far as i know we don't have any other plans to keep it remote we do have certain um for example we have like our dfe cohort that uh, that's the department for education where uh, everyone on that cohort is remote although they do have they can come in if they want they can come into the office whenever they want to learn um and, but i'm not sure when the next round of the dfe places will be available. I think they're getting reviewed at the moment. So there's nothing that's open currently that is that I know is fully remote. So I hope that answers your question. Um, yeah, I don't think we'll be getting rid of fully remote ones uh, entirely. Um, because uh, the good thing about the hybrid is uh, it's nice to see people in person and all that kind of thing. But um, it does mean that you need to be centred around London, which obviously everyone isn't. Um, so there definitely will be hybrid ones, uh, remote ones available at some point in the future. Um, yeah, I don't know exactly when those those will be. Yeah, we'll definitely um, uh, we'll be updating on our website. If you go into the apply section, we will always, whenever they're released, we'll always have it on there and it'll always tell you um, if it's if it's remote or not. But I'll try find that out actually from um from our team and try get a clear answer on that for you. Okay, hey, uh, will there be a pre-course as before before for four weeks? Um, so John, you might be better to you might be best to answer this question. Um, yeah, so we are moving to a slightly different model, um, which won't have a pre-course involved. So at the moment, uh, the way it currently works is with uh, you have four weeks of part-time pre-course and then twelve weeks of the full-time course. Um, the, the new model that we'll be switching to will be uh, a 16 week course. And so instead of it being part time and self led um, for the first four weeks, you will have a uh, coach. Uh, it will be coach led and um, uh, you'll have kind of the extra assistance and the curriculum will be a little bit more detailed as well because uh, you'll have more time to complete it. Um, so, yeah, we are. Uh, there won't be any, um, I think. I don't think we've got any more pre-course ones in the pipeline. But if we do, it will be the very last ones. Will be like the next one or two. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we're moving to the uh, sixteen-week course very soon. Okay. Hey, oh, I've got another one pop through. Uh, Rebecca was asking, "What's the quality of the online session, considering maybe?" 15 to 20 students at, at the same time um for for the workshops um usually we'll have yeah so it is about it is about that it is about 15 people at the same 
round about that. It kind of sometimes it's less, sometimes it's more. I think the most it's been about twenty five, but um, we've got really great feedback from it. Um, our coaches will uh, kind of have people work in little teams and break rooms and do tasks together. Uh, I would say it's very valuable. People have said it gives them an idea of how they would be taught from remotely so it's because I think a lot of people worry about it they, th they, they think oh if I'm working remotely I might not be able to um, absorb the information as much but um, from the feedback we've had we've heard that it's um, a really great way to have a little taste of what makers is like and what you'll be learning and that's why we've actually changed it now so we used to learn, teach people Ruby and now we're teaching Python so the next round of workshops will be based on the Python fundamentals um, so that people anyone who applies um, doesn't get a shocker, basically. Um, just to expand on that a little bit, um, a lot of key philosophy of the course is uh, self-led learning. And part of the reason for that is that uh, you can't, it's just physically impossible to teach everything that you need to know um, about coding for a full career in 16 weeks. But what we can do is um, teach you the fundamentals and also um, hopefully build the skills um, required to be to have the confidence to tackle any problem in the future so uh, the you will start with um, python in the, at the beginning of the course and then move on to javascript and the idea behind the javascript weeks is it's we give you a kind of method to um, learn a new language um, and hopefully at the end of that you're able to take that method and apply it to anything and so we have makers getting hired in all sorts of languages um, that are nothing to do with the ones that we teach on the course, because a lot of it is to do with the skills. Um, as a part of that, the uh, teaching hours are um, guided towards that principle. There's supervision from coaches. They're there to help you when you get stuck and to explain concepts if there's anything that's not um, not clear. But a large part, part of the time that you spend on the course will be working through the materials. And when you get stuck, building up the process to get yourself unstuck. Um, you're not left on, on your own. The team, like uh, Coaches are always there to help if you need it. Um, but that's, that's a lot of the process behind the way uh, we work at Makers. And so the um, sessions that we run um, are follow a similar model in that way. We might introduce a new concept, explain the basics, maybe show a couple of examples, and then send students out into smaller groups to attempt that problem themselves. And then at the end, come back and we can discuss discuss the problems that people came in, came up against and the uh, differences in approach that different people had. Um, yeah. There's a number of different kinds of sessions that we run. That's one style. The other would be uh, depending on what uh, concepts people are struggling with in the weeks, uh, in the weekly materials, we might organize spe uh, sessions uh, for the cohort throughout the week that are just kind of a little demo to address those problems. Yeah, thanks very much, John. Um, okay, so we've got a question about the curriculum change. As you're replacing Ruby with Python, so I guess the 10th of July cohort will have an entry challenge in Python. Is that right? Yeah, um, that's absolutely right. We used to um, have students do the Code Byte challenge in Ruby and Code Academy challenge in that. We've, um, but we've changed it to now um, a different challenge where once you speak to our core sales team, um, they will send you the chat. It's a, the challenge I believe that they've um, decided on is it's one that was um, designed by our director of training. And she's um, basically, so it'll be a personalized one from us. Um, you'll have to complete. Um, and then I think they might, um, ask you to do another I think maybe there's two challenges on Python um I think the other one might be on Code Academy but I'll have to double check that um but yeah basically learning as much Python as possible before you apply or um yeah just start to think about that and uh, lesser Ruby or I don't know I mean John John you might be a better um person to talk about this do you think Ruby is something that um students should leave out of that process just before they apply? Um, honestly, a lot of the um, the foundational things that are pre-applying um, are common across uh, all languages. So the, the different kind of data types you might use, uh, strings, numbers, arrays, that kind of thing. Um, I'm 
not super up to date on what, like what the application process is, what the uh, the quiz that we give you there, but um, a lot of the fundamentals are the same. And so it will be purely uh, minor syntactic differences, which symbols you need um, between the two. Uh, but, but a lot of the foundations like that we teach you and that we kind of hope you know by the time you apply to the course um, will be the same. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know exactly what the process is going to be, but um, if you've spent a week learning Ruby, it's you. That's definitely not time wasted because it's it's all transferable. Yeah, exactly. Um, and like like we said, this is all like, this is all very fresh as well. You know, it's just it's just sort of coming down. Um, follow-up emails to you so that you know exactly what your next steps are before you apply and um, we've got another question so how does job hunt how does the job hunting process work do we have the opportunity to apply to makers hiring partners um yeah absolutely so how the job hunting process works is um once you graduate um finish the course you will basically um be put into our alumni community and through that community you'll be um <clears throat> put in touch with um a careers coach and they will help you do workshops on cv building um and just various workshops on diff different like interview processes interview skills and then we will have our, we have our partnerships team who's the other side of the company who basically it's their sole purpose to get you a job so what, what we do is we have various different events where we'll have careers fairs um, where we have our clients come in our hiring partners come in and they get to meet you all um, and they present to you uh, after that you kind of decide what company you like and you can apply for the jobs with them sometimes they'll offer sometimes they'll have a few roles available sometimes they'll have one it depends um but it's not just careers fair of course like we all we um we have hiring partners who solely want to hire makers so basically when we've got a new range um when we've got new graduates out a, a graduating cohort our hiring partners will just get in touch um with, uh, with anyone who's hiring just to find out if they you know if if they're available to offer interviews for you um, and then we also have lunchtime talks where it's kind of similar to careers fair in that sense but it's a bit more intimate where it will just be one company that will come in um, or just do an online um, sort of presentation to you uh, so yeah we have we have lots of different ways um, and usually we're quite successful in that sense where we most of you know I think they used to have Prior to the pandemic, I know that's a long time ago. Prior to the pan pandemic, I think it was a hundred percent guarantee job success. But after that, obviously, a lot has changed. You know, the industry goes up and down. So, I would give yourself this is something to probably take on if you're applying. I would give yourself a good few months, um, three to six months, um, of just making sure you have that time to job hunt, um, because sometimes it can be. Some of our students can be luckier and have, get a job straight away. And sometimes it takes a little bit more time. Um, so it just depends on how the industry is going at that point. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Um, okay, so we have another question. Is there any particular resource that you would recommend for the entry challenge for Python? Previously, makers asked us to learn through Code Academy for Ruby. Um, because it's a personalized one, um, from our um, from uh, our head of training, uh, I can't send that out at the moment. But um, I don't know if there's any challenges you would recommend, John. I know that on Code Academy they probably have some Python challenges. I know Code Academy is quite good, but if there's any other platforms you recommend? Um, yeah, Code Academy have a Python course uh, online, and uh, for learning the basics, it's it's fine. It will do. Yeah, I'll teach you all the syntax for, for the fundamentals of, of um, programming, which is, is all you really need. Perfect. Okay, next question is, hi, I'm on the Code About Challenge now. How long does the application process take from this point? Would it be possible for me to start on the cohort on the 29th of May? Um, so, unfortunately, from... 
my perspective, we won't be able to take anyone else at this point until July. Um, so I think, and I think the code, the code about challenge is, if it's the Ruby, if it's Ruby that you're doing, that will, um, that is being sort of scrapped at the moment for the next open cohort. So I would say probably not. However, I'm not sure because our core sales team has, you know, a list of everyone who's actively applying and on each cohort. So I'll have to double check that. Unfortunately, I'm not 100% sure. Um, I will take your name. I've got your name here. So I'm just going to note this down um, in my little notes and I'll make sure I find out after this call. But because we're not teaching Ruby anymore, I'm not sure. I, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. Um, okay. All right. Okay. Any more questions? Hang around for another little while, just in case. Okay, next question. We had Ruby, Ruby on Rails and RSpec for testing previously. Is there something equivalent for Python like Flash, Django, that would be taught to us? This is definitely a you question, John. <laughs> um, I think the exact uh, Python um, curriculum is uh, TBC, but I, so I don't know for certain, uh, it's currently um, being written now. Uh, but I would imagine uh, Flask and Django have a pretty high likelihood of ending up on there. <laughs> what you said. <laughs> I should really learn, learn some Python. Join the course, Nikki. Mm -hmm. You never know. You never know. Um, also, just to say, we also have um, information sessions every Tuesday at 12.30, uh, which I will link in um, to the follow up among everything else that I've um, talked about earlier. And that's with our core sales team. So if there is um, any more questions that you feel like you still want answered after this, you can always sign up to that. And um, yeah, it's, it's it's super helpful. And then if you want, you can go into the um, workshop straight after that. Okay, any more questions? No problem. Oh, next one. Uh, when would it be possible to know how many weeks in per in person and how many remote for the tenth of July cohort? Um, John, do you know how often this will uh, be? I don't know for certain because again, it's the the new sixteen week um one. But just to give you an idea, what we um used to do for the previous one was it would be the first two weeks um would be in person. Uh, then the last two weeks would be in person. So it would be four out of 12 were um, kind of mandatory in person. And then there was a couple of weeks in the middle, which are during the, some of the group projects, which are um, where it was kind of optional if you wanted to come in or not. And because it was group projects, we kind of organized the teams in such a way that the people who were on site were uh, in a team together and the people who were off site were on a team together as well. Um, uh, not certain for the the sixteen week one, but I think it's probably likely to be similar, where um, it's about a third of the time is expected to be on on site, um, and then there's uh, other times where we kind of encourage you to come on if you're able, um, but typically or if you want to come in, that's fine as well. It's it's up to you. Mm -hmm.
if you um, email the admissions team, they might be able to give you a more concrete answer on that. Yeah, I think for sure on Tuesday, um, that will be something that a lot of people will want to know. So um, definitely recommend you ask then if you if you plan on joining. OK, so we've got next question. You have fully, a fully remote option, right? I don't live in London. Um, <clears throat> We currently don't have any fully remote ones that have been published. There might like there might be ones that will come out in the next few months, or there might not. It's just um, John and I don't because they've been doing hybrid for quite a while now. Because um, after the pandemic, it just seemed to make sense. But um, if they do have one, it will it will be posted on the website. But currently, there's not, unfortunately. So there's none you can actively apply for. Um, we do have a DFE, um, one which is um, a fully funded boot camp um, with the Department for Education, and they will be fully remote, but that's also not been published yet. So it's just a kind of waiting game in that sense. Um, I think uh, almost certainly we will have um, more fully remote cohorts in the future. Uh, this cohort that's just that you've seen today um, was a fully remote cohort, for example, but um, I think just in the schedule for the next few months, um, we've got remote ones. Uh, sorry, we've got uh, hybrid ones there instead. Um, but there will be. I'm, I'm. I think it's very unlikely that we stop doing fully remote cohorts at all. Yeah. Cool. Okay. <clears throat> Any more questions? Going once, going twice. Okay, cool. Um, well, let's sign off and enjoy the weekend, big bank holiday. Um, thank you everyone for joining in for all your questions. Um, they've been really amazing and I'll definitely send all those resources for you in an in a email so that you know exactly how to log on to these events and stuff like that. But yeah, um, we hope you have a great weekend and thanks again for joining. Thanks for coming, everyone. Bye bye.